Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. Literally moments before we started recording today, Ferrari unveiled its newest supercar, a 986-horsepower plug-in hybrid beast called the SF90 Stradale. It's the most powerful road-going car ever produced by Ferrari, but it's not necessarily the fastest. Joining me this week to discuss this and other automotive news is managing editor Brandon Turkis. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing well. How are you, John? Good, thank you. And filling in the final chair is MotorOne.com senior editor Jeff Perez. How are you doing, Jeff? Good. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. So it is Ferrari Supercar Day. This is a very rare day. As a matter of fact, I looked it up, and the last time we had a a bona fide range topping Ferrari supercar debut, which was the La Ferrari, was all the way back in like 2013. So it's been nearly nearly six years um, since Ferrari um, has replaced the La Ferrari. This one has a more normal name. I remember when the La Ferrari debuted and everyone was like, what are we supposed to call this thing? Because <laughs> it has Ferrari in the name already. Uh, but this one is the SF90 Stradale. Jeff, you wrote about it today on the site. Can you can you run down the basic specs of the car um, so we know what we're talking about? Yeah, so I guess the biggest number is 986 horsepower. And that is with the turbocharged 4 liter V8 and three electric motors. Um, just the V8 produces 770 horsepower, which is kind of crazy because the V8 by itself makes it the most powerful V8 Ferrari has ever produced. Uh, but that's wow. a whole other thing. Um, yeah, 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds, top speed of like 211 miles per hour. It's quick. It's like stupid quick. I'm also looking at a couple other specs. For one, it's lighter than the La Ferrari, which I, I was surprised by because I assumed the battery pack is a little bigger. This one has a EV driving range of 16 miles, so it's definitely carrying around more batteries. So I thought it'd be a little heavier than the LaFerrari, but it's not. A couple other differences to note, you mentioned the gas engine is a little smaller than the LaFerrari. It's a plug-in. It's also all-wheel drive, which is not something you would have expected. I think the only other all-wheel drive Ferrari right now is the GT4C Lusso, right? which has a really complex and interesting all-wheel drive system. This one, though, has the drive system that kind of all plug-in hybrids have, where it's a gas engine powers one axle and electric motors power the other. So it's kind of the easy way to make all-wheel drive out of a plug-in hybrid. Yeah, and this feels where the LaFerrari was kind of experimental. It was kind of Ferrari's first uh, time with a hybrid. This feels a little more put together. It feels more like a traditional... I guess traditional is not a great word, but traditional in the sense of hybrid setup, all-wheel drive, three electric motors, pure EV driving mode of around 16 miles, like you said. To your point about it being a little bit lighter than LaFerrari, it's it's about 33 pounds lighter, which is good. I mean, you definitely didn't want it to be heavier considering the LaFerrari is already kind of heavy for being a, you know, as a Ferrari. It's, it's a super interesting car. So, Brandon, uh, let's talk about how it looks uh, because you know Ferrari has a great history of gorgeous cars. Um, how did this one strike you when you first saw it? I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, non traditional elements. I guess is is what I'll what I'll say. Uh, the shape is pretty classic. I mean, it's it's a mid engine Ferrari. You're going to be able to tell that it's a mid engine Ferrari from a mile away. I'm not crazy about the headlights. I've heard a lot of people both online and in our Slack channel saying that this car kind of looks like a rendering. And that's that's got a lot to do with the shape and the style of the headlights. I, I don't like the uh, squared off taillights either. It's it's it doesn't say Ferrari to me. I mean, I, mm. I want my I want my quad circle circular head or taillights, and I'm not going to say that they look like they could belong to a Corvette. But it's also it's a very busy design. But I I would love to see what one of these things does in a wind tunnel because one of the things that Ferrari has done better than just about anybody else on on their supercars or on its supercars are aerodynamics and you know making the most out of downforce without increasing drag and there's so many interesting little elements and body choices and styling choices on here that i i would really like to see how functional all of those elements are and where the the 
the SF90 gets its downforce and how much downforce it produces because that's really the measure of a supercar when it comes to handling is aerodynamic grip. I, I thought it kind of does look like a rendering too, but like a more modern interpretation of the 488, which, you know, is like one one or two rungs down uh, the supercar ladder from the LaFerrari. It didn't really look like as hyperbolic as as I imagine the really top rung supercars to be like, uh, you know, the, the old P1, the 918 that the LaFerrari went against. It just doesn't reach that level for me visually, but I agree with you that everything is is probably there for a reason. Right now, you know, we're looking at this and saying, "Well, it's the LaFerrari successor. It's the LaFerrari successor." And I don't think and I haven't followed this as closely as I probably should, but I don't think Ferrari has come out and said that. And we we've, we've talked about this in Slack that this could very well be more of a 720 McLaren 720S and Lamborghini Aventador Challenger and than a top flight, you know, modern or futuristic hypercar in the same vein that LaFerrari was and Enzo was and F50 and F40. So I, I think until we, we hear more from Ferrari, I think the big thing is going to be the code name because F40, F50, the Enzo was the F60. I believe the LaFerrari was F70. So if they come out and say, well, this is the F80, then... Hmm. You know, it's very clear that this is the crowning achievement for this generation of Ferraris. But right now, I don't think we know enough about it. And looking at the stats, it 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 does strike me as Ferrari just throwing down a gauntlet, not against you know the the next top flight McLaren or next top flight Porsche, but Lamborghini and the mid range or as close as a mid range as a seven twenty s could be. <laughs> Uh, McLaren and saying, you know, this is this is what we're bringing to compete with you guys. They they haven't had a competitor in that class uh, in any any real way. the The four eight eight and the four five eight kind of got there in their their hardcore track versions, but you know, the seven twenty s and the Aventador were always a very different type of supercar than than the four eight eight was. You know, I hope you're right, uh, because I I think what what is the cognitive dissonance in my head is a near 1000 horsepower production vehicle not being the crowning achievement of the brand. Uh, But I also I I think you've you've probably nailed it that um, we shouldn't jump to conclusions that this is the LaFerrari successor before Ferrari confirms it. And and like I said, this literally came out uh, minutes before we started recording this episode. So there might be more news to come out in the days and weeks to come from Ferrari. Um, something else happened when uh, we when this car debuted. Uh, we got a lot of comments on Motor One, um, probably spilling over from our sister site Inside EVs, from a lot of Tesla fanboys. Um, and as oh, we're, we're, we're we're gonna do this now. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do this. Yeah, this is this is a continuation. Okay, we're gonna do this now. Great. Okay, here we go. This is a continuation of a conversation we had before we hit the record button. But I wanted to say a fight, it. a uh, fight. Is it, you know, well, yeah. So we had some Tesla fanboys in the comments, and they they were eager to point out that um, this Ferrari uh, was nothing special because a Tesla Model S P100D could still beat it in a straight line uh, to 60 miles an hour, um, which definitely, um, I would say, lit the fuse on you, Brandon, because <laughs> you and, and the Tesla fanboy community uh, do not see eye to eye. Um, now, I... I I look at it as, you know, Tesla, of course, has this community of both lovers and haters that are over the top in defending and tearing down the brand, uh, which is annoying on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, But it's also uh, kind of a special thing about Tesla, just like it used to be about companies like Apple. You know, people care that much about the brand, either love it or hate it to that degree. Um, I also think, you know, it's, it's fair to acknowledge that, yeah, Tesla Model S P100D is insanely fast, uh, zero to 60. Um, but it's also fair to point out that as soon as you start turning the car, um, or if you want to go faster or farther than 60 miles an hour, like a quarter mile or, or, or longer, the, the Model S loses its advantage. Or, you know, if you want to do it more than five or six times without, you know, cooling down. Hey. True, but you could argue that if uh, you took some other, you know, gas-powered cars and blasted them full out uh, 
five times in a row that they might not they might be a worse for wear after that as well uh i uh, yeah, yeah i mean uh, the the dodge <laughs> demon had to be engineered to withstand you know doing the dodge demon launches. is a dedicated drag car it's it's not it, it's it was designed to do that lots of other cars if you lots of other cars with that much power if you if you actually did five quarter mile runs at full full tilt five times in a row i i would bet you a number of them would not come out of that unscathed i mean i fundamentally disagree <laughs> um and i i would also point out that you know this this ferrari this sf90 or a McLaren 600 LT or any of those cars could happily spend an entire day at the track uh, without with nary a mechanical issue. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't say the same about a Model S. You can't say that it's not going to overheat after a few laps because there is no next to no cooling on it. You know, there, there's nowhere for the air to go. So, and I had this conversation with uh, with a designer at a. Uh, EV program for one of the the Model X's competitors, and he referenced that the way they designed it, or the reason they designed it the way that they did, was because they kept on getting the Model X to overheat while they were doing perform benchmark testing. So, you know, if your if your car can't do it, whatever it does in the one run doesn't matter if it can't be repeated. I don't want to be put in the camp of defending the the fanboys. I think they. They, they they are right in saying that in many circumstances a Model S can out accelerate most, if not all, cars zero to sixty. But nothing outside of that in terms of performance can the Model S keep up with with most high end performance cars. Sure, I you know I would I would happily take a Mercedes AMG GT four door on a track, and I guarantee that it would be better on a left right you know a, a road course than any model s would be i don't have a problem with tesla per se as a brand i i appreciate what they've done i respect what elon musk has done uh i have a problem with uh, the fanaticism and the the unwillingness to accept that maybe just maybe these aren't the greatest cars in the world I liken it exactly to to the Apple fanaticism um, that used to be around. I would say it's it's kind of waned uh, pretty substantially in the past. This is not doing very good stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and <laughs> but I think right now we're we're in the thick of of Tesla's you know fanaticism, um, and where it goes from here, I don't know. I don't know if Tesla will be around in a year or if it'll be strong and mighty in ten years. Um, you know, nobody really knows until that just comes around. Uh, but I, I do think it's, it's such an interesting automotive age for us when we do have such, uh, interesting car like a Model S that has this ability to, to accelerate as quickly as it can. And then when a supercar comes out, we actually have to acknowledge like that's that new supercar can't out accelerate this this four door electric sedan. It can do ninety other things better uh, in terms of performance, and, and that's great. And uh, Honda Odyssey can carry people better than a Model S can. There are always going to be cars that are better at one thing than the other. And getting your panties in a bunch because oh, this new car that has nothing to do with your favorite vehicle. But that's that's why that's why they bring it up though, because a Honda Odyssey should be able to carry more people than a model s a model s is a luxury sedan it shouldn't be able to out accelerate million dollar supercars like that's the, to, the i think that's why they bring it up every time let me put it like this the model s has been out for a long time the p100d has been out for a long time we've all known what it could do if ferrari what if ferrari the one of the premier automakers on the planet one of the premier performance brands on the planet a, a multi-time Formula One winning championship team. If they wanted to come out and beat the Model S, they could do it with one arm tied behind their back. The Tesla fanboys on Twitter are kind of missing the point, which they do a lot. Uh, <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> the Model S and the and the Ferrari are just two completely different vehicles. You know, going back to Brandon's point, one of them has a big V8 and is augmented by battery power, and the Model S is just a pure battery electric vehicle, which 
obviously is going to be quicker, right? Just because instant torque, even though it's a four door, even though it's much heavier, blah, 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 whatever. And again, the LaFerraris, or the, excuse me, the, the, I forget what this thing is called. SF90. SF90. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't uh, roll off the tongue. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Not well, at all. The, yeah. Again, to Brandon's point, this will just like destroy any Tesla on the track. So it's like trying to compare two completely different vehicles and doesn't make sense. Look, if 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 Ferrari comes out with a four door luxury sedan that is not faster than the Model S, I will be right there with the Tesla fanboys being like, "What the hell, guys?" Yeah. But the, that is not what this is. That is, this car has isn't even attempting to be anything the Model S is. Stay in your lane, guys. I agree with all that, but I still disagree that it's not remarkable that a four door sedan can out accelerate almost every car. I still think like, and I'm not, I'm not a, a fan, but it's and not, I'm not, it's I'm not, not defending, even... I'm not defending how they make their argument or that they hop into articles about Ferraris to leave comments. I'm just saying that a sedan, a luxury sedan shouldn't be able to do that. And it's so, remarkable that it does. Okay. So why do we, why do we get all up in arms, you know, about this when a Mercedes AMG E63 wagon, a wagon, mind you. Gets to 60 in 3.2 seconds. It's faster than a 911. Why aren't we saying, well, what the hell, Porsche? How come you guys aren't faster than this car that has nothing to do with your vehicle? I will read a comment that someone tweeted at us from a, sure. a Tesla fan. So their comment was, still slower than the five-seat four-door Tesla Model S and probably at least four times the cost. And this sucks gas, too. Try again, Ferrari. You'll get it eventually. Like, they don't understand that Ferrari wasn't aiming at the Model S, right? Like, that's not their benchmark when they built this car. It's, it's, I don't know. It's just kind of, it's hard to reason with, with a lot of the Tesla people yeah, and, and say that, you know, this car is better than this car when they're two completely different things. In the, I'll, I'll grant you, Brandon, that any of these automakers, when they want to make a car, they can decide we will make it exactly this fast. We will make it 3.5 seconds to 60. We'll make it four seconds. And they also decide how much it costs too. So then you bring in that into the into the fact. You know, some cars can do zero to sixty in three point five seconds. Well, you don't, you don't get you don't get to move the the goalposts like that. Like you want a car that's faster than this, then they can do it. Automakers have a lineup of cars, right? So they're not going to make every car they sell accelerate zero to sixty in three point five seconds. They're going to have different levels of cars that they sell at different prices. So same thing with the Porsche nine eleven. There's like. 20 different Porsche 911s you can buy uh, that that accelerate and have different levels of power and are priced differently. Um, I think, you know, I, I go back to this and I and I mentioned this article often. I mentioned it already in one podcast, but there's an article that Road and Track uh, published a long, long time ago. Uh, I, I forget the name now, but it compared the, it was in the 90s and it compared the, the Supra Mark, uh, what was it then? Mark IV? Uh, the Super Mark IV, the 911, and the five, Ferrari Testarossa 512 TR. Three cars that were wildly different uh, different prices uh, from cheap to kind of, uh, or relatively affordable to kind of, you know, a little bit high end to very high end. But they could all perform exactly the same. And the question was, what what was it about them that marked their, that, that explained their price difference? And I think a lot of that, that a lot of this is baked into what makes a Ferrari a Ferrari. I don't think for I don't think Ferrari does what you just said and uh, branded and says I'm going to make a car like exactly this fast. I think they have all their benchmarks, but there's a lot more ineffable qualities about a Ferrari that make it what it is and justify its price tag. There's the the design. There's the the racing heritage. There's caring about all those details that make a difference on a track, and and that's why a Ferrari is what it is. And um, and let's be totally honest. If you can afford the SF90, you can probably afford to have a Model S in your in your garage too. I completely agree. So, with that. You probably do. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You can you can like more than one car. It is allowed, guys. Absolutely, absolutely. But I don't think there's any reason. Like, I I don't I don't like reading these. Um, I don't like about myself when I read these comments from either Tesla fanboys or haters and have an emotional reaction to them. I think they're entirely worth completely ignoring because when you're talking to a fanboy, there's no argument. There's just this blind passion either for or against something sure. and you're, you're never going to change their minds on this 
Like that's, no, it's you know, not a it's not a discussion. It's not you know a meeting of the minds. Uh, I I do think it's interesting to talk about Teslas and all cars as they relate to each other. That's why I think it is interesting to note we live in an age where there's a four door electric sedan that can accelerate faster than supercars. Like to me, that's an interesting fact. But I, I mean, also I, admit that's all that's all it can do. And and in terms of very high performance and that it would get left in the dust in almost every other performance metric. But I, I grant it props and, and, and consider it remarkable that it can do that one thing. I take it by your silence. I have won the argument. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say you've won. I'd say I appreciate that the passion and I, I, I wish there was more of that kind of passion well, okay, maybe not that guy, but I wish there were more passion in the auto industry. You know, people that were really passionate about brands, somewhat like the way that Tesla fanboys are with their brand. But there, there, you need to introduce a degree of rationality to it. And you know, it, it's as fun as it is to you know drag a rival because you don't think that it's good enough. Uh, you know. It, well, here's the here's the thing too. Um, you know, there are Mustang fanboys, there are Camaro sure. fanboys. Into this discussion of general automotive have flooded uh, Tesla fanboys who may come from uh, a lot of other different passions, whether it's you know um, the environment or technology. So it's definitely, a, I think, a mixing of passions that is a little bit more high strung and a lot more tension involved than just the old Mustang versus Camaro stuff. Um, and you throw in the money at stake, and you know, just with I, I've been in, involved with Inside EVs, like I said, our sister site that covers Tesla and electric vehicles, and the people who are betting for and against Tesla in the stock market, the shorters, they are they have millions. Yeah, of dollars those on the those, line. those pe- I wish those people would just go the hell away. Nothing is below beneath them in terms of what they would do to help their. Uh, stake that they have in Tesla, either succeeding, succeeding or fading, and or failing, and and we've never had that before. Like we've never had that vested financial interest of Mustang and Camaro fanboys. It was more just a fun thing that that we all that, just took, I th- took sides on. I think that might be my problem is that they they take the fun out of this. Yeah, that's that's yeah, I, I like yeah, that's that. Totally that fun. is you know the it, it always seems like the, you know you're always arguing with a, a Tesla shorter or a Tesla fanboy and. It's you know, let's have an honest discussion. I I I would welcome that, but it, it never seems to be that way. It's just her her. Or your car can't go as fast as my car. Well, and on the internet, we don't know who those people are. Like we don't know if they're a shorter sure. or or what, yeah. Whatever. So uh, you, know, you know, it'd be all fun. the people it's, with fifty followers on Twitter and yeah, exactly. All the all the the fake accounts and and whatnot. Um, I don't know how this uh, conversation about Ferrari turned into a conversation about Tesla, but um, hey, you started it, man. I know I did. I took us down that path. Uh, let's do. Let's move on to a couple other uh, big pieces of news uh, this week. Uh, the week started with uh, FCA Fiat Chrysler um, announcing that they've proposed a merger um, with uh, the French automaker Renault. And uh, obviously, this is huge news. Within uh, Fiat Chrysler is the Jeep brand, which is kind of the crown jewel of that automaker and a brand that lots of, of automakers in the industry would love to have as part of their portfolio. So, Brandon, can you take us through a little bit about why this is happening and where the, where we're at? It's very far from a done deal. And reports first started creeping out about this on uh on sunday with rumors that you know we were gonna have some kind of announcement some kind of big thing was going to be coming up uh on monday and that came to pass uh, chrysler submitted or fca submitted to renault what renault called a friendly proposal <laughs> um hmm. that's a nice which, way to which put it. i think is <laughs> i love that uh that would be a 50 50 merger deal between the two companies uh honestly details at this point are are really lo- are really limited. We don't we don't know a lot about what's going on. We know that FCA as a brand has been trying to find a merger partner since Sergio Marchioni first took over. That kind of always had, has been his goal, and it's something that he's laid out in you know pretty much any time you talk to the guy, he's he would be on and on about mergers, and he was convinced, rightly so in my opinion, that it's the the future of the auto industry. 
And so seeing it happen here is is definitely interesting. It strikes me as a very good arrangement for for both FCA and Renault. Uh, as as we've laid out in our stories, both brands stand to gain significantly. Renault would gain a foothold back in the U.S. market, which I'm I'm very eager about. I I want myself a Megane RS. Um, and FCA would have a new partner in Europe and gain access to Russia and developing markets through Renault's Dacia brand. So it's 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 a deal that really works out for both companies, and they do have complementary lineups. Uh, as you said, FCA has uh, Jeep and Ram, which are just money printing machines. But at the same time, they're other model are there other ranges the dodge range and the laughably small uh chrysler, chrysler brand and are you know they're, they're struggling you know they haven't seen a lot of new product and as much as i love dodge continuing to stuff a hellcat in anything that will fit they they desperately need an injection of new product and reno has that ability uh, at the same time, there are some question marks. We don't know what this would mean for Alfa Romeo and Maserati. Renault doesn't have a luxury arm per se. They have the Alpine performance brand, but that has one model and it doesn't really, com- it kind of competes with the Alfa Romeo 4C, but that car is more or less dead uh, aside from the, I think they keep, they're keeping the spider on sale. So it, it, it's definitely it, it makes sense to, and some level it, it's but it's too early to tell what it could mean for other in for other brands you know, i can see some advantages uh for fiat chrysler in that in the u.s at least they don't have a a small vehicle presence in terms of uh small cars and they have zero electrification besides the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid. Uh, right. So and this could help them a lot there, uh, especially if, and and it doesn't feel like it's going to happen anytime soon, but if gas prices spiked, they would be caught out in the rain because they, they're like, they have, they have so leaned into just like the everybody high horsepower. Else. Well, they have so leaned into the high horsepower Americana identity uh, that they've fostered that they, they, they've just completely exited fuel efficiency and electrification. I, I would say at least at least Ford and GM and a lot of other makers in the US do have uh long term electrification plans. So but as far as I know, uh Fiat Chrysler has uh, you know practically zero um yeah, things going on in that regard. They're 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 dipping the toe. They have they have the Pacifica hybrid they're coming out with a renegade and a compass plug in hybrids. But they're not quite on the same level of Renault. Renault is, like so many European automakers, is a small car specialist. The Twingo and the Clio and the Megane are all, that's their A, B, and C segment cars, are all really well received in the European market. They have performance variants of both the Clio and the Megane, which are supposedly great. Um, They have an electric car called the Zoe, which you see pretty frequently. I was just in the UK last week. And I was in Norway three, two or three weeks ago, and Zoe's are fairly common vehicles. Uh, it's a handsome little thing too. Um, so there's there's definitely something to be gained for for FCA on that front. It, I think it's some of it is dependent on the market going where Renault is strongest. But I, I definitely agree that if if the market suddenly took a swing and FCA tied up with Renault, it, they'd be in a much better position than if they weren't tied up with them. My guess is that there's operational efficiencies to be gained here that makes the tie up make more sense than what we're seeing on the face of it. I imagine there's there's production and being able to use the capacity of the other automaker in their in their home countries or in Europe and North America that make a lot more uh, financial sense than just sharing vehicles or bringing vehicles over that aren't aren't sold there. That's another one of those details that's it's it's so hard to tell at this point, but I have to imagine that you know both companies are studying that pretty intently. I would I would like to be a fly on the wall on there, like uh, and those discussions. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a logistics nerd. So. Small cars are unfortunately not very popular right now in the U.S., but I'd love a Twingo. You know, I'd love to see some of these. Uh, it's rear engine. Cars. It's a rear engine, rear drive city car. Like that is mm. so darn cool. Yeah. 
<laughs> Incredibly cool. Another big thing that uh, also just happened before we started recording, completely out of the blue, General Motors announced two new SUVs. Uh, one is the Buick Encore GX, and the other is the return of the Chevy Trailblazer. Both of these vehicles are compact SUVs, uh, really compact crossover SUVs that slot in underneath the Chevy slots and underneath the Equinox and above the tracks. And the Encore GX slots right above the smaller Encore and below the Envision. To me, GM is really jamming SUVs anywhere it can fit within their lineups, um, which is not a bad plan right now. If you call something a crossover or an SUV, you're pretty much guaranteed uh, enough sales to make it worth your while to sell. Um, what do you, so Jeff, you've had uh, a chance to see both of these now. We've all taken a look at them. Um, what do you think? And particularly, what do you think about the Trailblazer considering the, the heat that Chevy got for bringing the Blazer name back on a crossover? Yeah, I think they're going to sell 8 trillion versions of uh, both of these. It's just, it's crazy. I mean, they could shove a SUV anywhere in the lineup and they'll probably sell a billion of them. Uh, and the Encore, I mean, it sells super well in China. It sells well here in the U.S. And a slightly bigger version, I mean, it's hard to see how that could even go wrong, right? Um, the Trailblazer is interesting because the Blazer is kind of like a half-hearted attempt to bring back that name. I don't know. It's it's a good little crossover, but I guess it doesn't feel like a real uh, reinvigoration of the iconic Blazer name, right? So Trailblazer is kind of weird, too, in that it's uh, slotted below that and that it's sort of the same thing, right? It looks like a little shrunken blazer with some Nissan kicks. Yeah, cues. these definitely, both the blazer and the trailblazer are definitely not direct descendants of the the more hardcore SUVs no. that they get their names from. Now, the trailblazer was never as hardcore as the blazer, but it was still a bona fide, you know, body on frame SUV, where these are both pretty much uh, soft rotors, can't do much off road. Imagine, imagine if they were named something else entirely. I think we would just say the blazer, or I would say, I, we would say, oh, this midsize SUV and this compact SUV are really good SUVs. Yeah. It's really, people get stuck on the name so much. And, and I'm, a, I'm actually a blazer supporter. I, I think it's the best looking mainstream midsize SUV. I love the Camaro cues it has all over it. And this trailblazer doesn't really have, I guess it has a little bit of that Camaro flair up front that the blazer has. It's just a handsome little compact SUV. Yeah, and I think the names Blazer and Trailblazer aren't as ingrained, you know, in car culture as maybe Bronco, that it's not as offensive to be like, all right, here's a new Trailblazer, and it's just kind of a funky crossover with some plastic cladding. I think people will say, oh, that's kind of cool. They brought back the Trailblazer and not be offended that it's this, which is fine. It looks like a fine little crossover. Yeah, I agree. I don't think people are going to get up, a, as up in arms over the Trailblazer as they did over the Blazer. The current Encore and the tracks are yes. both built in South Korea. Mm-hmm. On is that an Opal platform? These these could be, you know, GM no longer owns Opal. These could be the replacements once those cars go away, once they exit production, once Opal pulls the plug. If I recall correctly, some of the Encores that are sold in the U.S. are built by Opal in Europe. You know, the only reason I think that has merit um, is that they named the Buick version of this new SUV the Encore GX. Precisely. Which kind of, and I was like, I, I, at first, I thought it was just... And the, and the track's name didn't mean Jack to begin with. No, that, so. has, that has very little, if any, brand equity. But the Encore is, is a very popular vehicle for Buick, both in the U.S. and uh, elsewhere. I could see them wanting to retain that, but not caring about replacing the track's name. Just looking at the two, they look, they look extremely close in size. I don't know. It's, I'd it's, have to... I'd, it's hard to tell from the, from the images, but... The cargo space in the GX is five cubes greater than the Encore and three less than the Envision. I don't think it's dramatically bigger. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an interesting theory. Um, but I don't know. Maybe they'll try to sell them side by side and see how well they both do. See if one is cannibalized, if the new one's cannibalizing the old one. 
you know, or maybe this allows them to drop the price on the Encore and the tracks uh, because, frankly, it might it might just be a bit declared inventory. Honestly, it, it, well, the the tracks especially. I mean, the Encore was kind of priced with the yeah, premium the tracks, on it. The tracks is terrible. The the tracks though was like everything good about the Encore is taken out of it, and what you have left is the tracks, and yet it's but still, the, it isn't. Yeah, it's still, it's still a twenty eight thousand dollars car. Right, it's still overpriced. Um, so maybe this gives them a, a solid reason to uh, lower the price on the tracks because it's priced higher than I think it deserves to be right now. I don't know. In pictures, they look different. The new SUVs look larger than the than the tracks in the Encore. So I don't know. I'm I'm not quite convinced, but I think it's a solid theory. All right, so we'd love to hear what you think about um, these two new SUVs, what you think about the new Ferrari SF90 Stradale, and even the FCA and Renault merger, or Renault merger. So if you want to comment on any of the things we've talked about, you can visit us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, or you can catch us on our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find us talking in the comments. So coming up, we'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Before the break, though, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you're listening to this online, you can also subscribe to our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, um, as well as anywhere else you uh, get your favorite podcast from. So please hit the subscribe button so you never miss a show. Welcome back. During this part of the show, we're going to talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we'll start with Brandon. Brandon, what do you have the keys to this week? So I just had it dropped off. I've barely driven it a mile, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I do have the new BMW M4 CS. And I posted some pics at uh, the motor1.com inst- Instagram and on my own personal Instagram. You can see the stories on those and I'll keep updating them throughout the next week with the car, but I'm not going to talk about that because I've only driven it about a mile so far. But what I have been driving is the Lexus LS 500 H, which is a big full size hybrid luxury sedan. It's Lexus's flagship model and I don't like it very much. <laughs> well, tell us what you really think. Toyota has this, this long established history and a ton of experience building hybrid powered vehicles. And I don't know how they built one that is as uncivilized and coarse and generally unpleasant as this one is. There's a constant power struggle between the electric motor and the gas engine and the 10 speed automatic transmission to figure out exactly what is supposed to be doing what you know the the car has 354 horsepower it's a 3.5 liter v6 it's not it's not a new it, it's not a new approach to hybridization this isn't some bleeding edge thing this is a technology that lexus and toyota have been using for years and yet it's it's constantly confused about what powertrain to be using and when it does finally figure it out you're treated to a surge of power as it suddenly realizes, oh wait a second i'm a car i need gas power right now so let's accelerate with the gas engine and when that happens the sound is like taking a four-cylinder diesel engine and revving it up way way beyond redline like if you wanted to blow the engine on like a Jetta TDI and stuck a brick on the accelerator pedal, that's what this would sound like. It's just a really terrible sound, terrible sounding engine. And that might be fine if it were somehow muted out of the cabin. If it only sounded bad outside the which cabin, is, it'd be one which thing. Which is strange but for a Lexus. A, I mean, Lexus this is a luxury is sedan. Known. Yeah. Yeah, this is a luxury sedan. It's supposed to be quiet and Every time the gas engine kicks in, it just it's like a nail on the chalkboard kind of sensation. I've I've never driven an engine, or at least this year I've driven an engine that I dislike the sound of quite as much as I dislike this one. Because when you look at the hybrids they're really good at, which is the Prius series of cars, that family, and they've the four cylinder hybrids. They've expanded that to the Corolla. That's a much smaller engine. That's tuned specifically for fuel economy and not performance or anything else. And the transmission is an electronic uh, continuously variable transmission, which yes. is proprietary Toyota. They've they've tuned it and evolved it over years. And the whole point of that transmission is to seamlessly swirl together the power from the electric motor and the engine. 
And you go to Lexus, and then we're talking about a much larger gas engine, a ten-speed automatic. I transmission. actually scratch it. I am I am terribly sorry. I was incorrect. It is a CVT in this, an eCVT. It doesn't feel like one at all. That's interesting. well. Only, they could have added, you know, they could have added a program step uh, to it to make it feel like an automatic it's, transmission. It's really poor. It felt like they tried to apply the old the the ten-speed that they have in the gas-powered model to this and you know, lost something in translation. What surprises me more is the engine noise. I mean, Lexus has always been, or has for a long time, been the industry standard for um, quietness and serenity in a car. So to hear they have, you know, this engine that is terrible. It's just really coarse. It's here, yeah. And the thing is, it's not even that quick. I mean, the the Audi A8 with the the three liter V6 is feel significantly more powerful than this it's this is isn't very quick off the line the throttle response is really dull even in the more performance oriented drive modes it's just i can't fathom the the thought process of someone that go walks into the lexus dealership takes one of these for the test drive and says you know what i'm not going to buy the gas powered ls i'm not going to buy any of the superior german luxury sedans i'm going to get this yeah, I don't know what would... I, I completely agree. I don't know what conversation goes on in your head and that you wind up on choosing that one. It's so frustrating because Toyota and Lexus do hybrids really well. The ES with a hybrid, which is a you know, a four-cylinder hybrid again, is a 2.5 liter, I, I believe. That's It's a very likable setup. I, I would rather have that than the gas engine. But this one is just... It completely misses the mark. You know, I, I and and I wonder if it's the engine size that that throws them off. Um, obviously, to to me, all hybrids work better when they are tuned for fuel economy, and the Lexus hybrids aren't haven't always been that way. Uh, they've they've kind of skewed more towards performance in some case with the especially with the LS, um, where it's kind of trying to to give you everything without compromise. But mm, it sounds like they they missed the mark on this one. I, I will say there are there are some things that I like. I, I, I think the cabin is very nice. I, I think the material quality is it's better than I remember it being. Uh, I drove an LS briefly about a year ago, and I don't remember being that impressed with it. But the material quality in here feels great. The, the driver's seat is extremely comfortable, even if the seating position isn't great. There's plenty of support. Uh, the stereo is very good. Uh, the infotainment system is horrid. It's still a trackpad, and John, as they all, all are you, in Lexus, we yeah. all know how you feel about that. Uh, so it's it's, but I, I keep circling back that you know as much as I, there is there's here as much stuff here that I like. It's just this giant, giant, just dog turd in the middle of all of this otherwise you know competitiveness. Yeah, well, maybe you should try to hop in the gas-powered uh, version. Um, oh, I'd be interested to hear. Won't, won't, probably won't drive another Lexus after what I just said. So. Well, I'd be interested to hear what you think because I wasn't a huge fan of that. But like I said, I, I judge these cars very harshly because uh, it's one of my favorite segments, and and I've, I've driven them all pretty much. And and I, I like I said, the Lexus felt like more of a second-tier full-size luxury sedan, even the gas-powered version. It's so frustrating because it's it's such a competitive segment, and uh, for Lexus to feel the car that that feels like this is just it's really disappointing. I, I I've come to expect better of Lexus. All right, well, let's see what uh, what you're driving this week, Jeff. What uh, what keys do you have? I will be a little more generous <laughs> to my car that I'm driving this week. Uh, I have the new Mazda three, which ah. Yeah, I am so... Hatch or sedan? Hatchback, which is the better option of the two. It's um, a better looking one. It is, even with that big, thick C-pillar. I don't know. I've driven the... I had the sedan a couple weeks ago, and the, the 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 new sedan is much better looking than the old sedan. It's much better proportioned. It looks like a, a, a well-proportioned sedan, and I think the last version did not. Um, yeah. Well, I think in general that segment... If you look at like the outgoing focus, if you look at um, you know the just other hatchbacks that have sedan counterparts in that segment, the sedans always look kind of frumpy and weird. Like they designed it as a hatchback, and then they decided, well, let's make it a sedan version too, and it's not as successful. Uh, but yeah, the, the Mazda three sedan looks really good. I still prefer the hatch. 
uh, which is what we have this week. And compared to, I guess, what other cars are in this segment or what are, what cars are left, like the Corolla Hatch or the Golf, um, I can't really find a reason to buy any of those other ones. Outside even of, compared to Civic? Even compared to Civic, uh, maybe outside of price, because the Mazda 3 we have is thirty one grand, which is not affordable. Um, but it's well, awesome. Well, it's also the new all-wheel drive. So when, yeah, when it's you throw that loaded. in, then if you're looking at all-wheel drive hatchbacks, the, you've pretty much narrowed down the, comp, the competition to the Impreza. Yeah, and it's fully loaded. I mean, it's got the premium package, leather seats, the head-up display. It's got pretty much everything you could ever need in this segment. Um, and it feels just so, it feels like such a premium car. And I know we say this about Mazda a lot with the 6 and the CX-5, that if you get a fully loaded version of any of these Mazdas, it feels like you're driving a luxury car. Yep, that's true. And I'll give you a good example because we also have an A4 all-road at the office, which not really a direct competitor, but it's similar. It's uh, and it's, yeah, techni- it's similar-ish. Technically a step up from Mazda just based on, you know, brand. Um and I would not buy the Audi over the Mazda based purely on how it feels on the inside because it feels so much cheaper than the Mazda, surprisingly. Um, that's, that's, wow. Yeah. I mean, I and I believe you, uh, especially because I've driven the sedan uh, version of the Mazda 3. How I, uh, my, my first judgment on the new Mazda 3 was that it's more of the same in a good way uh, because the the last Mazda 3 was already exceptional. And I felt like they didn't screw anything up. They just made everything like one notch better. Um, my only complaint about the new one is that uh, is the infotainment system. I used to be a defender of the Mazda infotainment system. And I got a lot of I, I, I disagreed with a lot of people about that. There were a lot of people who didn't think the Mazda was a very good system. And I'm I'm dropping my support of it because I feel like they've made it. Um, even a little more difficult to navigate. And I'll go down to one very specific action on the stereo, which is if I want to change the the satellite radio station from, let's say, Howard 100 to Howard 101, it takes like four clicks and five scrolls of the wheel to do it. Like there's not one button or knob I can turn once to make it go one station up or one station down. I have to go into menus and then scroll a bunch of times. And it's it's worse than it was with the last generation Mazda 3 infotainment system. Well, so. I, I don't necessarily agree completely. I will say that that is annoying, trying to just change one channel and you have to go through four different steps. Um, but I, like you, I wasn't super, I wasn't, uh, I didn't really hate the last gen Mazda infotainment system that much. I thought it was fine. I thought it felt outdated as newer cars came out with better infotainment systems. Uh, but I still think this one is a step up. It's super clean, super easy to use. The uh, the rotary dial in the center console is just super nice, super easy to use. You can, get, you can scroll through anything. Uh, it's just a really good car. And to your point about Mazda not messing it up by trying to reinvent uh, this version over the last one, it's still awesome to drive. It's still probably one of the best driving cars in this segment. Uh, and the, this one, I think, is 186 horsepower and 186 pound-feet of torque. It has more than enough power. It never feels lethargic. You never feel like you need, you know, a little bit more. It's just an awesome car all around. You know, I'd like to check in with Mazda the three months, six months, eight months down the line to see what the take rate on the all-wheel drive is. I want to see if that was a good bet by them, that a lot of people were waiting for that or wanting it, or if it ended up, you know, not people not being interested in it. So, Jeff, my, my one question for you is, since you're driving the hatch, how is the blind spot? Um, it's noticeable. But I won't say it's the end of the world. I guess, you know, I always use the backup camera. I've never really been a rear view mirror kind of guy. I mean, technically, you're supposed to look everywhere. But the the backup camera is more than enough for when you're backing out of somewhere. There are certain instances where you're trying to look out the back and that big C pillar is in the way. But it's definitely never uh, a huge issue. What about if you're just trying to change lanes on the highway looking over your shoulder? Yeah. Well, that 
So the greenhouse in general feels really small. So the side windows feel small, and I guess that big C pillar has a lot to do with it. Uh, yeah, that's to, to me. That's um, I, I think it looks great aesthetically, like what they did. But I think that's a, a negative effect. Is that kind of claustrophobic feeling that you might get inside because there's a lot more sheet metal than there is glass? Yeah. So this week I had the keys to the Kia Soul X line. Um, which Jeff, I know you just recently had that as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just had it a few weeks ago. And um, the curious thing or the interesting thing is that I'm actually an owner of a Kia Soul. My wife drives a 2014 fully loaded Kia Soul and she loves it. And we did a lot of research before buying that. So I was really interested to get into the the all new Kia that came out this year, specifically the X line, because I think it's the best looking version of the new Kia. They've got kind of the base model, the X line, which is like the ruggedized or SUV ish uh, version. And then the GT, which is supposed to be like their sporty high performance version. So I was super excited to get into the X line. And my first impressions are great in that I think they improved on all of the kind of innate parts of the uh, soul. So I think it drives better in both handling and ride. It feels really tightly put together. Nothing rattles. Um, you know, the, the the suspension soaks up bumps. The, the platform feels super solid. Um, so it feels like a, a more expensive premium car compared to our last gen soul. My disappointment, again, has to do with packaging. And the, for whatever reason, Kia has made the X-Line only available with a limited selection of features. Whereas the GT model, you can get everything. You can get the really large infotainment screen. You can get the push-button start and keyless entry, heated steering wheel, heated and cooled seats, like all the real premium features you can get on the GT, but most of them are excluded from the X-Line. And I don't understand why. I don't understand the reasoning for that at all, because I like the way the X-Line looks more than the GT. So my preference would be to get if I were buying again, a fully loaded X line, but I can't because the only fully loaded version of the soul you can get is the GT. Yeah. Um, I, I understand that, but I also appreciate that Kia offers the X line, you know, which is like the ruggedish trim at a pretty low cost. I mean, how much does that one cost that you're driving? You know, I didn't get a sticker with it, so I can't say off the oh, top of my bizarre. head. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's it's below it's like at 25 or below. So you're okay. right. It is it is a really reasonable price. Yeah, and it's um, a, and like you said it just it drives so well. It has I mean, it doesn't have everything, but if it has CarPlay and it has air conditioning, for me that's fine. I know a lot of people want more than that, but I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I want a little more than that. Yeah. Hang on, John. I have your Monroney right here. Oh yeah, tell us what the what the price is. So you sir have the Soul X line in gravity gray. The starting price is twenty one thousand six hundred and twenty dollars. Super and low. Your, That's really reasonable. Your as tested price is twenty two thousand six one five. Yeah, so uh, that, there are, that's there are no options. Yeah. I, I believe me, I know. Um, <laughs> there, that, and that's a, that's an incredible price for a really good car. But I feel like if I were a buyer I would be sitting at the Kia dealership being like, I want, I want to give you 27,000 for a fully loaded one, but you won't let me like, like, so, so it's great that it has a low starting price and that people can get into it that way. But that to me, that doesn't mean it should exclude more expensive versions that come fully loaded. Uh, I just think they should have offered the GT and the X line the same way. Like you could get them, um, with less options or you could get them fully loaded. Um, that to me would have been easy. And quite frankly, I expect, uh, I expect Kia will do that eventually. Um, they'll probably see that, that people are asking for that because I think the, I think the X line is good looking enough that most people are going to want that version. Um, and they're going to start complaining. They can't get it loaded. I was going to say, I, I, it seems, it seems odd to, limit the the appeal of the rugged looking version when crossovers are so big right now you would think that if you were kia you would want to convince every single customer that well we know it's a soul but really it's it's a crossover guys yeah the the crossover look is is super valuable right now um and i would make the argument that 
even though there's a lot of vehicles out there that get this kind of faux off-road treatment, um, and we all make fun of them because they really can't do anything off-road. I mean, the Soul doesn't even offer all-wheel drive. I would argue that when they do that, the the faux rugged version still looks better than the regular version. Like anytime you you SUVify mm. a vehicle, I think it looks better, including yeah. the Spark Active. Thank you yeah, very much. That was my choice. Oh God, here yeah. we go again. Which you've yet to get me uh, one to review. Or it's again. not in the fleet. It's not in the fleet. They're never going to put it in the fleet. It does they not should. exist. They should. GM, GM, if you're listening, please put this car in the fleet. John will give you coverage. I don't even know if they make it anymore, to be honest. I, <laughs> I've seen it on the road a couple of times, and I scream out unicorn at the top of my lungs every time. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Jeff on Twitter at Not a Boat Captain, Brandon at Brandon Turkis, and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Thank you guys for being here with me on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it was, it was fun. And thank all of you out there for listening, and we'll see you next week. 